Hello, folks. Uh, thank you for attending the last session of the day. You guys are so brave. Thank you. <laughs> Uh, I am Dominic, and this is my colleague Sean. Uh, we are working for neighbor, especially working in the cloud native area. Uh, I'm also I am also a maintainer of Apache OpenWhisk, which is a cloud native serverless open source serverless platform. Uh, so, uh, how many of you are aware of neighbor? Sorry, a neighbor. How many of you? Yeah, okay. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> yeah, honestly, I expected no one. Yeah, so anyway, so the neighbor is one of the biggest companies in South Korea, even though no one knows. Yeah. Uh, we have been running uh, many cloud native platforms for several years. So today we'll, uh, we'll talk about how to build the multi-cluster L7 load balancer, which is resilient to, to the IDs failure. Okay, so from now on, Sean will take over the speech. Uh, please welcome him, and I'll be back soon. Hello, I'm Sean from Neighbor in South Korea. I'm glad to be here, and it's an honor for me to speak. I will start the presentation by explaining why we chose this subject, and I will talk about the challenges that we encountered to when we developing the SM load balancer for multi-cluster and operating the load balancer. <coughs> load balancer. So before I start, uh, let me introduce briefly about the neighbor. Neighbor signifies the, the individuals who navigate the internet world and they were the 10th largest company in South Korea, who has with uh, $23 billion <coughs> market valuation. And they were providing uh, various services and search services, one of the core services of the neighbor, having the largest market share in South Korea. And also neighbor is providing commerce service with the shopping life and recently acquired a Poshmark in order to provide the global service and also involved in the fintech industry and content industry with Webtoon and Snow and also in involved in the cloud industry. So from now I will explain the reason for concentrating the L7 load balancer for multi-cluster. As shown in this diagram, significant outreach uh, could be occurred by the various causes, but infrastructure-related causes such as power and network and cooling problems are the most common reasons. In other words, IDC-related failures are the causes of most outages. So we found that one of uh, <coughs> one of famous incidents about the IDC failure. That was the Delta Airline data center outage in 2016. It was it caused it caused outage due to the electrical equipment failure, and about 2,000 aircraft were unable to depart for three days, resulting in <coughs> about 150 million dollars loss. There is another incident that global switch data center outage due to caused due to the UPS cable fault, and this uh, resulting in the 85% of user services were <coughs> re restored after six hours of recovery operation. According to the Uptime Institute, these significant outages are happening more frequently and their duration is getting longer and causing increasing economic losses. And during 2019 and 2020, the percentage of outages costing more than $100,000 climbed from 39% to 16%. And last year, there was also IDC failure in South Korea, which affected the neighbor's services, but the damage to the neighbor services was relatively small because the, the applications was, were deployed across the multiple IDCs. As you know, to mitigate the damages from the IDC failures, the application must be deployed the multiple IDCs. Furthermore, the load balancer in front of the, the applications must be dis distribute traffic to multiple IDCs. 
Labor is currently operating 58 Kubernetes clusters in eight regions. This allows for the distribution of application across multiple IDCs. To, to provide seamless services for distributed applications, we are operating L7 load balancer across 14 Kubernetes clusters in eight, uh, five regions. From here, I'd like to share the challenges we encountered when de developing and operating the L7 load balancers, as well as how we overcame those challenges. I suggest you to consider that you are developing your own load balancers that is resilient to the IDC failures. The first challenge is the IDC failover. Our objective was to develop a load balancer that distributes traffic to multiple IDC. And the load, balance, the load balancer must be deployed across the multiple IDCs, and the multiple IPs must be mapped to a single domain to do this. Additionally, when, I, when an IDC experiences a failure, the routing to that IC routing to that IDC must be excluded. So there is a need to develop the dynamic DNS to handle IDC failover challenge. The, the second challenge is about layer seven features. Our load balancer must support various layer seven functions. It must be intelligent enough to understand the layer seven protocols, enabling L7 based routing and circuit breaking, lane limiting, and shifting and other functions. Third challenge is programmability. We also wanted to make the <coughs> make sure clients could update the configuration of load balancer themselves, rather than having to call to administrator whenever updating is required. In other words, all functions of load balancer should be real time adjustable by uh, APIs. The challenge here is that user invoked APIs is working synchronously, but the Kubernetes is asynchronous. So therefore, there is a need to bridge the gap between these two. Fourth challenge is globally available. If a user's application is deployed internationally, routing based on the locality of the application should be considered. In other words, depends on the application's requirements, it might be required to route traffic only to the same region. And also, if some region or IDC experience a failure, failover to another region must be available too. Finally, our, as our load balancer system evolves, changes to its functionality or structure may impact user data, therefore, all the data must be easily migrated even without user intervention. In summary, our task was to develop the cloud native load balancer and we call it Elastic Load Balancer. This is the same word with uh, Amazon. Let's have a look at how we handled th these five challenges. And first of all, let me describe the simple ERB architecture that Neighbor is now operating. We will explain more, we will explain more but we are using the Istio Envoy to build ERB. Uh, DNS server and first tier Envoy manage user requests to allow to enter the ERB cluster. And the first, the first tier envoy is used by many different services, and this structure allows for the efficient use of public IP addresses. So, if you have, uh, if you have any uh, enough public IP addresses, you don't need to apply this divided first second tier envoy architecture. And there is a second tier envoy which handles the user specific routing. This the second tier envoy is created for each user service and is used to de deliver L7 functionality such as L7 routing and HTTPS redirection and health check and so on. For the lane limit functionality, 
There are also rail limit components and Redis cluster. Working with the second tier envoy, it may be used to apply the limit configuration to each user service. And there is also a health check component that checks the status of every ELB clusters. And the health check service monitors the status of first tier envoy and automatically excludes the DNS records if an unexpected response is received. Finally, there are also API servers and SED to handle the user requests. From now, let me explain the, how we deal with the IDC failover challenge. As seen in this diagram, a DNS query for the domain pool.neighbor.com will be responded with the four ERB A records ranging from 10.10.10.10 to 10.13. User requests may be routed to four ERB clusters. However, if an IDC1 experiences a failure, we need to detect IDC failure and invoke the dynamic DNS action to exclude 10.10.10.10 and 10.11 DNS records. And for reference, only foodandable.com domain is represented, but all domains that are registered in ERB will be affected. To detect IDC failure and invoke the dynamic DNS action, we are operating health check component. As I mentioned earlier, Health check services have a role to check status of every ERB cluster's gateways, and health check service operates in a full mesh configuration across all ERB clusters. And this key format is used to distinguish the state of ERB cluster's gateway. So here is an example. The following example shows the result of status of cluster one's gateway zero performed by cluster two, three, and four. And with these examples, cluster one's gateway zero will be defined healthy. And if there are some connectivity issue or IDC failure, then the result will be written with failed. And then health check service will define cluster one's gateway zero as unhealthy and dynamically excludes DNS records. Our DNS servers are configured with hidden primary and secondary architecture. With this architecture, we can protect hidden primary DNS from unpredictable threats. Without integration with the secondary DNS server, changes from the pr primary DNS cannot be dynamically reflected to the secondary DNS server. For integration, we made the hidden primary DNS to send notify message to secondary DNS to trigger the AXFR protocol to obtain all DNS records from the primary DNS. It's important to note that sending a, not a DNS notify message whenever a user updates the domain could cause a significant load on the secondary DNS. To avoid this, we are operating separated notifier component to trigger primary DNS every 10 seconds. As a result, hidden primary DNS will send notify message only every 10 seconds. Through this procedure, secondary DNS will be respond with dynamically updated DNS records. Finally, we can handle the IDC failover challenges by dynamic DNS and health check component. From now on, Dominic will take over the speech. Dominic. Okay, thank you, Sean. Uh, hi, I'm me again. Uh, now let me explain how we provide the L7 features. Uh, precisely, this is not a challenge, but we wanted to show you what the load balancer we are building looks like. So first, let me explain, uh, let me introduce the Istio Envoy. So Istio Envoy is an open source service mesh product. Uh, it, pr it has various L7 features. It is mainly used for uh, service mesh, but we can also use it as a dynamic L7 proxy. 
Uh, I'm not going to talk about Istio Envoy deeply in this session, but if you are trying to build L7 load balancer, then you should definitely consider this. And this is how we design the system uh, in an abstract level. ELB has many different models to effectively design L7 features, such as service, routing, domain, and backend, etc. So the first one is service model. The service model is a logical unit for a unit that includes other models. So when a service is created, then the underlying Kubernetes objects, such as namespace, service, ingress, gateway, etc., are also created. And this is the uh, structure of, of the service model. So basically, it has some metadata, such as created that, and updated that, and revision, and so on. And these metadata define the basic structure of ELB models. And especially, the service model has the regions and configs field. So the regions define uh, which region the service should be deployed to, and the config allow us to uh, configure some auto-scaling or uh, connection-related settings. And this is how our UI looks like. So when a service is created, uh, default domain is also created, created. And once service is created, then user can access to the other UIs for routing or backend domain and so on. And the next one is the domain model. So domain, domain model defines a domain to be used in the load balancer. So a corresponding DNS record is also created when a domain is created. And uh, Istio gateway and virtual service objects are internally created. So if you are familiar with Istio on Envoy, then maybe you can easily understand what's going on under the hood with those objects. Yeah, and this is the structure of ELB domain. <coughs> it has some fields like host and certificate and some HTTP options like HTTPS redirect. And this is what the domain u creation UI looks like. Uh, it just corresponds to the models. So it has the same fields and options. Yeah, and there are many other mod models, but I'm not going to talk about all of them. I don't want to spend too much time to explain just the similar content. So I left them as appendix. So if you want to look into them, then you can refer to the appendix. Yeah, the, the next one is uh, maintenance mode. For whatever reason, uh, you, you may want to put a certain cluster into maintenance mode. You may want to upgrade your Kubernetes version, or you may want to restart uh, the container network modules, and so on. So, so, so in such cases, uh, we, need to sh we should rule out that entire cluster. So whenever we put a certain cluster into maintenance mode, the IP addresses associated with, with this cluster should be excluded from our DNS. And this is simple to achieve because we have our own dynamic DNS. Yeah, now uh, I'm going to talk about the programmability. When a user communicates with our system, uh, the API call is synchronous while the underlying Kubernetes is fully uh, asynchronous. So because of this different way of uh, processing requests, there are a gap between the two. And this is where the declarative APIs come in handy. I believe you are already familiar with the declarative API if you are also familiar with the Kubernetes or GitOps and so on. The declarative APIs imply that we need to define a required state and the appropriate mo module monitor this required state and apply changes until the system reaches the required state. To compare the required state, uh, we used revision. So actually not only the revision, but the actual object is considered. But anyway, we need to compare them with the required state. Uh, and even while we are applying a chain, the required state can be changed again and again. And even the required state can be a deleted state while we are still creating an object. 
As a result, our system should constantly retry operations and check if the we reached the required state. And this part is handled by the, the, the reconciliation loop. Actually, it is uh, quite similar to the Kubernetes operate operator. <coughs> Sorry. <coughs> the loop should be run repeatedly, so it should be idempotent. We also use the uh, producer consumers method to define a state and handle the change. With this approach, we can respond to the client synchronously while our consumers are applying changes asynchronously. And each model has its own producers and consumers. And this diagram shows how producers and consumers are interact in a multi-clustered structure. Since our SED is clustered, so all events can be delivered to the consumers in each cluster. Uh, when an API server receives an API call, then it will produce, it will define a state, and this event will be handled, consumed by all consumers in each cluster. And they will also start a loop to manage the underlying Kubernetes object. Uh, for each model, uh, we have pre we predefined the sets of operations. Uh, in this example, when a service is created, we need to create those Kubernetes objects. So we define an operation for each Kubernetes object. And our loop will execute those operations and check if the required state. And if we didn't reach it, uh, the required state, then it will run again and again. And we made a loop uh, generic enough, so <coughs> it could be shared among other models. And <coughs> sorry, I will just. <coughs> As you can see, the parameter init resource is a function. So this this uh, returns a list of operations and target revision and termination operations. The loop operation has a string field to indicate the object type of the function, the, the op operation, and uh, it has also a function that contains the primary logic of each operation. And again, these are also generic enough to be used in used for any module. And the t termination operation operation is a function that returns the can terminate, which indicate uh, we can terminate the loop or not. This is an example of service operations. So it has uh, <coughs> ob ob the object type for each operation and the actual functions to execute. And now the main logic of the loop looks like this. So. As I said, first it will initialize resources by calling the init resources method, and it will run the given operation one by one. And finally, it will run the termination operation to see if we can terminate the loop. And this is an example of termination operation. So whenever a loop runs, <coughs> we store results to SCD. Uh, this is because our processes are completely asynchronous, so we need to store the final and the intermediate results so that our UI can track the state change. And finally, we can compare the revisions to see if we can complete the loop. Yeah, the next challenge is our LD should be globally available. The, the load balancer should be globally available. It means that uh, we must dynamically provision resources <coughs> to the required region only. So in this case, uh, if the services region is Korea, then the necessary resources should be provisioned in Korea on only. We don't want to provision res uh, resources that will be unused. 
And when the services region is changed into Korea, US East, and e Europe, then we must also provision resources to new regions. Similarly, we may no longer want to use a certain region, then we need to clean up all the resources in that excluded region. So when we uh, run a loop, we must first determine whether the cluster of a region of the cluster is included or not. So we compare the region of the cluster with the services region. If it is not included, then uh, we try to fetch a namespace. And if there is a namespace, then possibly there is also some resources to clean up. Yeah. So in this way, uh, even if the consumers in each cluster receive the same event, we can dynamically provision or clean up resources. And another important thing is uh, when a service is running across multiple regions, then it is usually necessary to serve uh, traffic from a certain region in the same region to reduce the latency. So if traffic, uh, traffic coming from Korea should be handled by an ELB, uh, ELB running in Korea, and traffic coming from the US East should be handled by the ELB running in the US East. For this, we rely on the GSLB product. I believe you can use any GSLB vendor, just like Akamai, because uh, our system, this system design is uh, vendor neutral. And to have more control over DNS, we configure the GSLB with the uh, region specific C names. So even if two different cl clients from two different regions reserve the, the same uh, domain, they receive uh, different responses. And these C names are finally reserved by our DNS server. So we can dynamically change the underlying IP addresses for a certain domain. Anyway, in this way, we could optimize the latency based on the location of client. Not only for the location of a client, it is also important to uh, route traffic to the nearest backend. And this is achieved by the locality of backends. So you, as you can see, we can configure the region and zones for each endpoint. With this location information, uh, ELB can route traffic to the closest backend. And this is achieved by <coughs> endpoint priority. We, we internally have priority for each endpoint. So the endpoint with the highest priority take precedence. Actually, uh, this uh, closest meaning, uh, the meaning of the closest can be different uh, in each region. So the different priority and uh, priority for each region is specified against the same data. So here, uh, Europe has the highest priority. And we may also configure a uh, locality failover to redirect uh, traffic to another region in case of uh, any region is failed. This is also possible with the endpoint priority. So in this example, uh, if the US East region is not available, then the traffic will be routed to the Europe region. This is because the Europe endpoint has the second highest priority. So we can prioritize the Europe region above the Korea region. The last challenge is data migration. Uh, there are three cases that are relevant to data migration. The first is, uh, the model change. So in this example, uh, the new field region is included, uh, introduced to the domain model. The second one is change in operations. So even if the model remains unchanged, the corresponding operations can be changed. The third one is model dependency. Uh, it is not strictly related to data migration, but it is critical to manage data in a consistent manner, so I also brought this case. So in this example, routing has the host for one domain. 
when a new domain is created, then the new host should be applied to the routing objects. So in, it implies that the two models are interdependent. And because there are so many models, so the dependency network may become convoluted. So it is critical to manage them correctly in the first place. OK, in the following slides, I will explain how to handle them. First, the model change is straightforward. We simply update all data. To update all data, we have implemented migration APIs. So we defined a, a specific API path for migration APIs. And it includes a uh, date and name for just for migration um, management purpose. So for example, we can have these kinds of APIs. So we can get all the backend data that need to be updated. And up, uh, we use post API to actually update all data. So in this manner, we have defined a pair of APIs whenever a model changes. Surely it is absolutely crucial to make system backward compatible, even if there is no data for new fields. The second one is the, uh, for operation changes. Yeah, to handle this, we created one API called sync, sync command, and it will manually start a loop. So the loop can be started without updating any data, and it will perform new operations based on the updated codes. Yeah. For this reason, our loop should consider not only the revision, but also an actual object change. The final one is model dependency. Uh, here, the easiest approach could be just updating the routing data whenever a, the domain is created. But it can easily cause the conflict with the visual request. So instead of updating data, uh, we defined another interface to trigger an event. So it will just simply trigger the, that event, and the loop will uh, fetch the dependent data, which is the domain data in this case. And af after then, the consumer will apply changes based on this data. OK, so in this way, we defined our own data management principle. So in a certain consumer, we do not change the model of other modules. We do not make consumers write any data. Data should be written by producers only. Whenever the data model changes, we have implemented migration APIs. And when there are modifications to operations, then it, we, we must handle them in the, on the consumer side without altering any data. Finally, all operations must be idempotent and backward compatible so that loops can be safely repeated. OK, so let me summarize our presentations. Uh, we show you five challenges that you will face while when you build the L7 load balancer. And you could handle the IDC failover with the dynamic DNS and cross IDC health check. And for L7 features, we introduced what Istio Envoy is and how we designed the ELB models. And we demonstrated how to design the declarative APIs and reconciliation loop and producer and consumer method to handle the gap between the synchronous and asynchronous processing. And to make uh, LB globally available, we had to dynamically provision resources and uh, uh, route traffic based on the locality of client and backend. And we also discussed uh, the data, my data management challenges and how to address them. Okay, this is the end of the speech. Thank you for listening. Okay, do you have any questions?
talked about uh, data migration, I assume that you mean the, uh, the data of the load balancer itself, that means the configuration data, right? Yes. Um, and you said there is a sync API for doing that? Um, is that, what happens if one cluster is down and comes back and the data changes in intermediately? Does the, doesn't the loop uh, recognize that there's a mismatch in the data? Yeah, okay. Uh, actually, we, we are storing uh, data in SCD and if a certain cluster is not available at some, at some point, then and if we restore the, cl uh, the cluster, then uh, it will initiate the loop for all data. Since the loop is idempotent, we can safely uh, start the loop again and again. So whenever we, I mean, our API server uh, st uh, start, it will also start the loops for every data. Since if there are already, I mean, the operation is already applied, then we can safely just skip the loop. And if there is no da data or no Kubernetes object, then it will just uh, provision at, at that time. Thank you. Um, for the loop implementation, do you, do you have multiple workers working on that loop or just a single like main worker that yeah, on it. Uh, there are multiple API server instances. So uh, one of the instances will start the loop. This is based on the SCD transaction. So every single instance will try to get the transaction first. And if it, uh, it succeeds succeed to achieve that transaction, then it will start the loop. I see, so you rely on SCD to lock that, so only one Thing yes, can work only out one time. instance work at, at the same time. Okay, thanks. Okay, no questions? Okay, thank you for attending this last session. Thank you, guys. Thank you.